So I'm Elise Frelichardi from UConn. I'm a sim director there. Um, and this is using simulation strategies to teach gender diversity and discrimination, a simple approach for complicated conversations. So this presentation represents a collaboration between the Sim Academy and diversity and inclusion in EM and women in academic EM. So it's a um, combination of all these efforts. So representatives from all the different academies work together to put this together. Um, disclosures, uh, Mike Falk currently has a disclosure. Um, Lexi. So I'm just going to review the outline of the workshop. So today we're going to discuss key concepts on teaching topics on gender, gender identity, diversity, sexual orientation, and harassment. How faculty can use SIM to teach these issues to trainees and healthcare providers. Demonstrate how to teach these concepts using SIM. Discuss and debrief the audience following a example simulation. And conclude with thoughts on how we can move forward in a collaborative fashion. Um, we have a a big group of faculty who worked putting this together, um, and I'm going to have them all introduce themselves. Naran Nadir, Kaiser Permanente Modesto, the PD there, and also the SIM director currently. Sarah Hawk from Russian Chicago, I'm the simulation director. Hi, Annika Baxter, Emory University. Sorry, <laughs> I don't have a voice. Ava Pierce, Associate Chair for Diversity and Inclusion and Emergency Medicine, UT Southwestern, Dallas, Texas. Joel Mall, Virginia Commonwealth University. We just coincidentally have laryngitis. Good morning, I'm Lexi Mannix. I'm the Assistant Residency Director at the University of Florida in Jacksonville. Hey, I'm Mike Falk. I was a former Director of Simulation and a Fellowship Director at St. Luke's Roosevelt in New York. I'm currently a Pediatric Emergency Medicine Dentist at Children's National Medical Center. And I'm the President-Elect of the Sim Academy. I still, I'm confused why I did that. <laughs> All right. So, Joel, you're, do you, I know. I don't have a clicker, I'm so sorry. You can get your mic. Okay, so I think for a lot of us in the room, we probably know why diversity matters, and that's obviously why we're all here. Um, however, sometimes it bears a little reminding, so I'm gonna to try to go through a few points. Um, as a matter of correction, I am no longer the immediate past president. That is Ava Pierce, who's here with us of ADIM, so um, as of yesterday. So um, I, when I submitted it, it was true, but anyway. Um, uh, no financial disclosures. Unfortunately, I'm not fortunate enough to do that. Um, here's a picture of the Grady's. So Anika can probably comment on that. A lot of people, when I was at Emory, would come in and they talk about being at the Grady's. And the reason they talked about the Grady's, plural, is because literally it was one side was African American and one side was white. And obviously there's a lot of legacy that still exists, the fact that people still refer to the term. But we know that that's obviously not very quality care to be separate, is not equal. Although who knows in this current climate, maybe that will be relitigated. I hope not. Um, but we know the Institute of Medicine, or now the National Academy of Medicine, back in 2001 put out the, the domains of quality and one of the six domains of quality is equitable care. Because we know that when you don't have equitable care, it leads to health care disparities. And even for many of us who are involved with training our future learners, our future residents, the ACGME with our clinical learning environment is looking at how we handle and teach about health care disparities and things like that in, in our emergency medicine training programs. So this is something that's very apropos to everything we do on a regular basis. And then finally, you know, I think it's important, everybody in this room probably knows, but sometimes the light bulb goes on to people when they finally realize that equality and equity are not the same thing. And it's so much more important that we're equitable in our care because that takes people's complexities and their various backgrounds and beliefs into account. But history still casts a long shadow. Comment about the Grady's, 
This is the Confederate White House, which is literally right across the street from where I practice emergency medicine at Virginia Commonwealth University. And as you imagine, it probably evokes a visceral reaction uh, when people come and have to walk by the Confederate White House to come to ED, which is, you know, Richmond is a majority uh, minority city. Um, and when you talk about health care and health care decisions that people make to this day, it is influenced by some of the things that we have done in this country, whether it's Tuskegee, whether it's giving electric shock treatment in the 50s and 60s to people who are LGBT, people who are still getting conversion therapy, you know, some of which is pretty hideous um, to this day um, for being LGBT. And so there's a lot of things that continue to go on in our society and a lot of historical influences I think is important to appreciate of why equity is important and inclusion is important because change is happening. You know, this is a picture of a good friend of mine's kid's birthday party. I love this picture. It just is a snapshot, but it just tells the story. This is where our society is going. The people who were the typical majority for years in the United States are going to become quickly the minority. So when we think about the patient population that we see, we're getting more diverse, we're getting more multicultural. And so it's important for us to be able to understand and relate as emergency physicians when we are the safety net for everybody, um, to be able to understand and, and competently care for these patients. Um, is medicine changing? Unfortunately, not so much. I mean, yes, we've made some advances. Medical schools are now essentially 50-50 as far as gender goes, actually a little predominantly female now. But if you look at emergency medicine, if you look at medical school in some other areas, such as black males going to medical school, we're not making much progress. And it's sad to say that emergency medicine with ACG media data is the second whitest specialty to ortho. I mean, we all like to make fun of ortho and vice versa, but how many people want to say, we're whiter than you? I mean, come on. Um, and then women in emergency medicine is not much better. So we're, we see everybody. We, our patient population is no doubt the most diverse and inclusive that exists in the United States, but we as a group do not always represent it, so we need to make sure that obviously we address that, but also that we're teaching our learners to be competent in taking care of all kinds of people. It's also important that allies matter. Nelson Mandela, when he became president of South Africa back in the 90s, after being incarcerated for decades, mm -hmm. one of the things he did in the South African um, constitution was to make sure that marriage equality and equality for all people of different backgrounds was included. You know, so it's important that we came as allies because when we come together and try to teach about diversity and inclusion, if we're not inclusive ourselves in that teaching, I think we all lose. Intolerance matters. Um, obviously, a picture of the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally from a couple years ago. Um, a lot of that, obviously, is still in the media today. Um, this is a study from a few years back that showed that if you looked at all-cause mortality in places that were judged to be less tolerable, it could take 12 years off of somebody's life who was in a marginated or stigmatized group. And we all know from the minority stress model that that is because of this high constant level of stresses, um, and being a stigmatized group or a marginalized group can lead to some serious health care disparities and affect people's access to health care. And so we want to do what we can to be co culturally competent to take care and welcome those patients so that they're comfortable coming to see us. Because obviously we know from the literature out there that that's a huge barrier for a lot of patients to want to come to see us because we don't make them comfortable. Um, and then obviously educating us is an important part to that. So, to wrap up briefly, and I apologize for going quickly, but I'm trying to get what's left in my voice to last. We're an incredibly diverse country. We're an incredible country because we are diverse. Visibility matters, visibility within emergency medicine, visibility in words and how we interact with our patients matters, and cultural competency improves care because quality care is equitable care. And it's important to understand that if you are understand and familiar with these topics, you're going to be better, you're going to be more accepting, you're going to take care of patients better, and you're going to be able to speak the same language and help the values that are important to our patients, which is ultimately why we all went into emergency medicine. Thank you. I'm, I'm Mike Falk, I introduced myself earlier, and I'm just going to give us a brief lecture on why we think simulation is a useful tool for doing this. How many folks in the audience are simulation or medical education people? Okay, fair showing. So, w when I took over our sim program, one of the first things I did with our residents was um, I gave them a lecture on what do I do in simulation. 
and I said, I don't teach medicine. And they were shocked by this. I'm like, what do you mean? I don't teach medicine. I teach teamwork, communication, and leadership. You learn the medicine on your own. Simulation is a very cute little game that's designed to trick people into learning. And that's why we felt when we had this conversation about a year ago why this is such an important topic for all of us to get there and to do because simulation to me is an incredibly natural venue to do this. So, um, you know, simulation now it's an essential part of emergency medicine. We use it for teaching communication. And we thought, you know, if we can use it for, for t teaching other forms of communication in high stress or breaking bad news, why can't we use it for talking about issues of diversity or racism and discrimination. Um, simulation covers a whole gamut of things. Is all the, everyone knows about the high fidelity stimulators, the bells and whistles. Um, if you do disaster triage where you do a card game, simulation. If you use standardized patients, simulation. Anything like that is basically comes into our gamut. Um, I put this in here because if you look at the ACGME and the milestones underneath professional values, accountability, patient-centered care, and teamwork, uh, team management, they all list interactions with your patients, respecting the autonomy of your patients, respecting the identity of your patients, communicating with your patients. These are all core values that we now have to and should, should have been teaching emergency medicine residents for a while. And obviously within those, that wheelhouse of those EM milestones, what is included in that is dealing with issues of diversity, dealing with issues of discrimination, and dealing with our own inherent biases that we bring into the workplace. Because sadly we all do. Uh, there we go. Um, so uh, Naran Nadir, who's sitting here, did a Delphi project where she looked at simulation. And one of the things that showed is simulation was being used for the remediation of communication and interpersonal skills. Um, and it's also that it's probably the most amendable of simulation didactics is simulation assessment is amendable for teaching, learning, and assessing the milestones for emergency medicine. Um, other examples of how simulation has been used just to teach around communication, especially around difficult issues of communication. Anesthesia residents were scored on delivering bad news using a simulation-based model. NICU and pediatric residents have also been scored on assessments for breaking bad news. Uh, personal anecdote, my third year residents in the ER, I made them run a sim scenario at the beginning of the year for all of them, which is a, a baby brought in an asystole. And the whole point of the scenario is to talk to the parents about the fact that the child is dead and you need to stop the code. Um, so there are other examples of how simulation has been used for uh, working around communication and breaking bad news. So longitudinal skill courses for medical students. Um, they were asked for breaking bad news, uh, a difficult question. Ironically enough, the nursing community has taken a far more aggressive and been a far more proactive approach on using simulation and medical education using simulation to teach around issues of communication with their patients and patient-centered care. Um, so it's really interesting that we're finally getting into that wheelhouse too. Here's a couple examples of student self-reflection after being involved in simulations that are revolve specifically around issues of communication and specifically around issues of communication dealing with difficult topics. Um, so where's the tie-in here, right? Just telling someone that their kid is dead is not the same as trying to teach residents that they might have an implicit bias or that there is biases within how we do in the emergency room. So, but could we use, say, a simulation scenario where you create a scenario where the resident has to go in and deal with patients, um, more, different ethnicity, different socioeconomic status, a whole variety of issues, and use that to elicit and to demonstrate the implicit bias that the, the resident has. Um, so here's an example of sim simulation training with two standardized patients with ACS. So one was homeless, poorly dressed, alcoholic patient. The other is a high-level white-collar executive. Students were assigned to see both the patients and consistently they treated the white collar executive better than they treated the homeless patient. I'm sure that probably doesn't surprise most of us, but think of how, how, how enlightening that would be to maybe a first or second year medical student who doesn't really get it. Because um, I mean, you know, one of the ironies is most of us who go to medicine don't recognize that we are overwhelmingly privileged, um, also overwhelmingly white. Um, and come from a whole background of advantages that help us get here in the first place that we almost always fail to acknowledge until later on in life. And some of us never do. Um, so, recorded in the handout, there's a bunch of references 
on how um, you can use simulation or how simulation has been used for this. Again, I apologize for being so brief on this. We really wanted to get this through as fast as we can so we could break out into the a simulation scenario which is designed to look at these issues and then have a larger conversation in the group um, about what you, how you feel about this, other issues that maybe we can do, and even steps going forward in a collaborative fashion. Thank you very much. So we're going to do a simulation case for you guys. I'm going to um, hand these out. We can also distribute them electronically if we don't have quite enough. Um, it has two cases on there. We're doing one of the two cases. Okay. Oh, thanks, guys. And you guys. This one on. Yep. So on. Testing on. So these guys are gonna do a, a brief scenario without a lot of any of the medical stuff. But this is a very ill 78-year-old female um, with a strangulated hernia that has been determined by the surgeons to be non-operable. So our resident is tasked with speaking with family about this. Hey, Dr. Hawk, can you come talk to this person? They keep bothering me about bed three. I know, I know she's sick. Like if the epi I, I, can, I can take care of that, okay? okay? I'll update you on the blood pressure, but will you please go talk to her? Yeah, thanks. Hi, uh, ma'am, I'm Dr. Hawk. It's nice to meet you. Hi. Um, so I understand you came in to, how are you related to? Uh, We're roommates. We've been friends for a long time. How is she doing? Is she doing okay? So, you know, we're taking care of her. Uh, but, you know, are you related? I'm, I'm looking to try and talk with her family. I'm a very good friend. We've been together, you know, for 25 years. She's my roommate. Um, how is she? I, I am blind. I can't really see very well. And I knew she was not well because she was vomiting and, you know, eventually stopped responding. And I called the MS, but nobody is telling me what's happening. I, you know, and, and the, the paramedics shared that with me. I, I just, I'm, I'm trying to um, make sure that I have her family and her, her next of kin, you know, the, the right person to talk to about what's going on. Uh, who would that, who would that be? Like, is, Well, I mean, for all practical purposes, it would be me because, you know, her family hasn't really been in touch with us for a better part of 25 years. Uh, it would be me, I guess. So, but, but you said you're her, her friend, so... Uh, should, yeah, I mean, yes, I'm should, her should I like, could I, could I call her, does she have kids or anything? No, or like no, a, like she has nobody. She only has a brother who lives out on the East Coast, okay. but he hasn't So talked. could we call her brother? I mean, I have a phone number from 25 years ago, but like, we well, haven't we, talked for 25 years. I mean, I, for all practical purposes, I'm, I've been her friend for all these 25 years, and I need, I, can you please tell me what's going on with her? I'm right, really but, worried. Know, I'm not supposed to disclose medical information to, to friends, uh, neighbors, roommates. You know, I, I should really talk with her family. No, but, 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 but I, I am that person. I've been with her for 25 years. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, I might, are you her, like, are you married or you know something we, we can't we well in this state we can't do that so we've just been together but we you know we've been living together for 25 years <clears throat> okay um i don't really know if i'm supposed to like tell you all of the um stuff about her but i i, I guess i you know she's pretty sick and um we're gonna have to is she gonna make um, it is she gonna what's wrong with her so can we like can we you know can we get her fixed up like she, she does everything for me. Like she's, she manages the accounts, she manages everything. I'm blind, she literally takes care of me. Like can you, like what? Right, uh, so I, I, yeah, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about kind of what's going on with her. She's, she's very sick, she's got this hernia. 
um, that, that the surgeons say that they're not going to be able to, to operate on. And I, I'm sorry that this is kind of a, a, a lot of news for you all at once. Uh, but can't they operate? I thought hernias were operable. Uh, well, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a kind of a complicated situation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more in a moment. Um, but I need to go back and check on her blood pressure. Uh, and, and I'll be back to talk with you some more. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, that's the end of the case. All right, Sarah. So um, how are you feeling right now? Um, really awkward. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, and as I was trying to figure out how she was related, mm -hmm. but I did a really horrible job and... <laughs> yeah, so I think that a uh, thing that you're kind of bringing up is balancing, you know, being there for our patients, being an advocate for our patients, and then these laws like HIPAA laws that are, that are pressed upon us and right. trying to balance that and figure out if this is the right person. Right. Um, so while you were doing that, I saw kind of a, a lot of stress in you, especially thinking about the patient that you had to get back to. Exactly. Um, and I think that that's a real good example of what it's like to be an EM doc, you know, trying to balance all of those things at the same time, balancing multiple patients. Um, can you share with us a little bit about what that felt like? Um, you know, I, I felt like our conversation was taking a long time and she wasn't really telling me who she was. Um, I, I thought maybe she was like the patient's partner, but she wasn't telling me that. And I feel like, you know, like a roommate, I'm really not supposed to tell information to a roommate, so I didn't want to. And then, like, she wasn't married, so am I supposed to tell her or am I not supposed to tell her? Uh, so I wasn't sure. Yeah, those are really great points. Um, Noreen, do you have any feedback about how the interaction went? So I could sense the angst in you and trying to get to the bottom of it, but. You know, from my perspective, um, you know, this case was based on a real interaction between two people. And, you know, the reason why people sometimes frame their relationships in sort of euphemisms is because they're either embarrassed or there's some kind of societal pressure to not disclose. And in this particular case, the interaction was happening in a fairly conservative community where it was frowned on to have any kind of relationship outside of heterosexual relationships. And therefore, for 20-something years, this couple had lived as roommates when they were not really roommates and they were more than that and it really eventually you know it becomes more apparent when you start pushing for medical decision making and who's the next of kin um, and in this particular situation the next of kin was strange and really didn't want to have anything to do with the family even though you know you were able to get a hold of them and everything so while it's true that I, I could sense it I think from the way you handle it I think at some point it was frustrating because I wasn't getting what's happening to my you know, loved one. I wasn't getting that answer. I know, and I was trying not to tell, if, if you were like the nosy neighbor, I was trying not to tell you in case she would like get mad at me or you weren't the right person to tell. And I, I felt like I was doing a bad job of figuring out who you, I don't know if there's a better way I could have asked the question because I, I just wasn't getting the answer. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you could have probably asked the question any different. I think it's just a matter of the circumstances. And I think from my perspective, I probably would have known, I mean, the patient's really, if she is, you know, medically futile, she's not going to the OR, she's likely going to be dead. Yes, that is a very sensitive piece of information that needs to be conveyed, and you will find out about it anyway, so I probably would have disclosed it, or I would have wanted to know about it early on. But it's hard, because you don't want to necessarily be telling everybody else without, the, you know, the first mm -hmm. person or the next of kin knowing about right. it, so. Right. All right, great. That's going to be the end of our debrief. We'll move on to the next part of our session. So that was an example of the, the debriefing that would occur after the scenario. So now we want to kind of debrief you guys. Um, we love debriefing. We're sim people. So we want to debrief you guys. We have some suggested questions, but we also have a panel of extremely intelligent, extremely experienced people here. So does anybody have any comments or questions, looking at the handout, looking at the case, looking at the objective and what you just saw? So I'm really going to try not to talk today, but I just want to point out, you know, this is an elderly person in this scenario that grew up and came into their adulthood at a very different time than what a lot of people are, even now, with some of the challenges that we face in our society. 
And so the reluctance to come out, the reluctance to talk about their relationship is still very palatable and very real for a lot of people who have had those experiences. And I think it's important as we are at different generations as educators and learners to understand that the stigmata is something that's real. And imagine now they're coming to the hospital and they're worried about whether their doctor is going to impose their religious views on them as opposed to what they want. So there's a lot of underpinnings that go into these scenarios that sometimes I think is a little hard to tease out. Just to underscore, I mean, I just took care of a family at Children's National. Um, the young girl was premature and a twin, and she came in for uh, Rule Out Street Stevens Johnson. And in the midst of all this agony that these fam the family is dealing with, um, the mother's partner, who happened to be trans, I don't care, said, are we going to be allowed to stay with her? I was like, what do you mean? And she said, well, the last time we were sick in Virginia, they wouldn't let me stay in the hospital with her. I mean, so it's, you know, it's Virginia's supposedly a purple going blue state, right? And they wouldn't let her stay in the hospital with a sick 12, a 12 month old because she's trans. So, and I, I mean, it was, just, it was amazing. That's, I couldn't figure out why they were so stressed about stuff when they first got in. I said, of course you can stay here. That's never going to be an issue and don't ever worry about that anymore. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a real, it's a real issue. And, it, you know, it's, it happens every day, and I think sometimes we, we tend to forget about it because we often live in pretty ivory tower bastions where we like to think that we're very equal and egalitarian. But at the same time, I think a lot of us probably do things without even not acknowledging it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I wanted to say for a second um, just about the cases that you got handed out. So the case one um, is the case that you saw portrayed up here. Um, with, with me hopefully acting as a resident might mess things up a little bit, even during the debrief, trying to understand. Um, <clears throat> but there's an instructor sheet and a resident sheet where you would give this sheet to the res So we're trying to give you a tool that you could take to your own um, place and, and use potentially. Um, so you would give the door chart to the resident and have whoever's being the instructor or the standardized patient or your faculty member, whoever it is, take a look at the instructor page so that they have the background and they have the scripting for themselves and they understand the objectives that might come out for the residents and the things that we're hoping that the residents will talk about as they go through the scenario. Um, case two is a completely different case um, that I used at my institution uh, with the help of some educators that are part of our um, LGBT advocacy group within Rush. Um, and it's, it's a transgender male a transgender patient that uh, presents as male and um, you have to kind of go through the questioning to determine that this patient now has PID. Um, and so it's a, it's a complicated case and I would say for each of these, if like me, you don't have necessarily the background to understand the nuances of how it feels to be perceived and things like being dead named and th like things that happen to transgender people that, that have not happened to me, um, try and see if you can get someone who is from, who's, who's willing to educate or is an advocate in that, within that community to be a part of your scenario uh, to help educate the people that you're trying to educate. Because that really helped me make the experience better for my residents. So I just want to point out, so I'd want us to be a little bit collaborative discussion. So would anybody in the audience mind sharing their experience or similar experiences or have seen anything similar happen in your practice? Yeah, I work in Palm Springs and we deal with these issues actually quite a bit. So we have transgender male, transgender, transgender female and their partners coming in and, you know, in California now that's really not the issue with marriage and stuff like that. So. But we see it all the time. We had, we had a transgender female come in who was complaining of, I can't pee. And there was family there that didn't understand like why she can't pee, but she can't pee because she had a prostate. And only on exam did we figure that out and then have to explain to her, you know, well, anatomically you're kind of a boy and this is why you can't pee and why we have to send you home with a Foley. And explaining that to the family member in the room was quite difficult or not even just the resident, but myself as well, so. Anybody else? So, uh, one, I don't know how many of you guys do the emergency medicine foundations for your group. Um, 
I recently went through with our third year residents the transgender uh, medicine section of it and uh, it was honestly it was kind of like one of my worst days as an educator because I kind of lost both sides of the learners. I had a couple of residents who were very flippant and were kind of like this is BS and it's I'm not gonna I don't really care and I had a couple of other folks that when I was trying to talk around the issues and use some of the tools inside that like the the gendered bread man and some of those visual stimuli they were like this is so condescending and disrespectful and I can't believe that we're actually having this discussion right now like and so I'm in this like spot where you know I'm trying to be a facilitator and I'm losing people on both ends and it ended up getting to the point where the learners between them I just told basically everyone in a nice way to shut up because I was like, y'all need to stop being so disrespectful around this content. But nobody, I don't think anybody got anything out of it. And as someone who's an instructor who's kind of in between two separate groups of learners and trying to be respectful and like I don't have any background or training in how to do this effectively, right? Like I'm not going to pretend that I'm even like close to a, a content expert. You know, I think that it was really challenging to try to speak to those issues intelligently in a way that gets everybody on the same page about what we're supposed to do to give these people the best care possible. Thank you for it's that faculty development, right? So if you're not comfortable teaching it, how are we, like, that's the barrier. When, I, when we were even going through preparing this, the barrier to us performing case two is that our debriefing of it, we don't have that first person perspective. And so we have to develop faculty. We need more of those resources because we know our residents are sorely undertrained, but so are our faculty. <laughs> uh, you know, just anecdote, my background is I have an adolescent medicine fellowship before I did emergency medicine. And uh, I used to work at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, which now runs the largest trans program in the United States. Um, and you know, it's, it's a unique experience. I mean, it was, it was back then we had a street clinic that took care of uh, the LGBTQ community. Most of them were involved in the sex industry. And it's these are, these are really hard issues to, to address uh, for anybody who is not of that community. I won't run the, a transgender case without a trans person being there. I, I think it's not fair to your residents. I, I have insight. I have no clue. I can't debrief this adequately or speak to the issues adequately. So um, if the people are interested in doing this, you just reach out to, I mean, I'll, you can share my email. I'll happily connect you up with uh, my friend who runs the, the trans program there and she's got connections all over the U.S. And I mean, I think that would be one of the first steps is, right, the first step to awareness is <laughs> admitting you have a problem, <laughs> it's, you know. So if you, and, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a hard way to learn it. It's a really hard way to learn it. But there, there are so many resources around you and it's around lots of these issues, substance abuse a whole bunch of issues that we don't always deal with. I just have a question because this is something that I absolutely want to start implementing at my facility because we do see this so much in our emergency department. But like, how do you go about doing it in a way, like Mike said, that is not going to be offensive to anyone? And like, if you don't have access to somebody who, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, makes great sense to have somebody who is an actual trans person come in, but is it just any trans person? Does it need to be an ED attending who is trans? Because that's not, that's not accessible to me at, at my facility. Like, it, it's just not. And so how do you do this where even in cross-cultural like barriers and you know, people that practice cupping and all of these things, to, to do that in a way that isn't going to be offensive because everybody's only one ethnicity and one sexual preference, right? And you will see speakers on our website that are willing to come to your institutions that have expertise in several of these areas of diversity and inclusion and share with you so not only your learners but the faculty that don't feel comfortable will feel more comfortable presenting these topics. Joel has done extensive work and I'll let him share some of the modules that he has. So it's on our website and I'm going to try to just not say much, I'm trying. Um, <clears throat> um, I think it's really important when you have those discussions to start off by laying ground rules and to say this is a safe space and we're going to talk about some things that may be uncomfortable for some of you and you may have your own beliefs but I think it's important to say that you know the joking is not appropriate 
you know, from the very beginning and to call people out and, you know, what is it that makes you feel like you have to make that, I mean, you don't want to call the individual out, but you have to call us as a society out and say, we're going to have a crucial conversation because regardless of what you believe, these are patients we have to take care of. And if you go in with that kind of attitude to take care of a patient, I mean, there's a lot, several studies out there that show well over 50% of people who are transgender avoid the emergency department because they have had horrible experiences. You know, it, I don't blame them. You know, I don't blame them. You know, I was telling Eva, you know, when I had my appendectomy, my husband was told he couldn't wait. He had to go leave. You know, I was married. He's my husband, right? And, um, and that was not in Virginia. That was in New York City. So it's often at the individual level. It's not at the level of the institution that I've retired or whatever. But I think you have to lay ground rules. Otherwise, your people aren't going to take it seriously. And you have to keep trying. You move it a little bit at a time. Well Absolutely. Um, I have, I'm the, um, Lori Rowland, I'm the SIM director at Henry Ford in Detroit. Um, as we're listening to these comments and, and this case, sort of the next step that I start thinking about is bringing in a simulated case of what do you do when you are the physician taking care of these patients and all of your staff, your nursing staff, your techs, your, are being insensitive, are making those jokes, are refusing to call people by their preferred um, pronouns, those kinds of things. I think that that would also be a very rich place to start uh, additional simulations of, so now what do you do? You, you're working on how you actually speak with the patient and the patient's family and those kinds of things, but then how do you control the rest of your, you know, being the captain of the ship kind of thing, how do you control the rest of your department? And that could actually go for many areas of diversity and not just trans um, or LGBTQ community. I mean, that could be uh, the, the homeless population, like you were mentioning, the drug, drug addicted, all those, uh, any kind of thing where those jokes are going and those comments are going and what do you do to control that? My OBGYN team at my shop does that. They do that um, because that's their their job, right? So, yeah, they do a scenario like that. And, and to your point, we use at my shop, we have a like a big patient instructor population, standardized patients, and many of them come from the community and were prior patients that, you know, had a bad experience and really wanted to teach. So I, I usually try to work collaboratively with my patient instructor people who direct that to try to let them know what our deficits are that they need to attempt to recruit because they work in the community with different groups to try to bring a representative population in for our students. Doesn't always work, but we try. I just got to add, you know, we, we forget about the sickle cell patient on a regular basis and how they get treated. I have friends, who, uh, my former partner had uh, uh, family members who had sickle cell and, uh, you know, you'd hang out for dinner with them and they'd say they'd, they'd rather you know get hit by a truck than go to an emergency room in a pain crisis given how badly they got treated so it's you know it's we we there's so many things that i think are appropriate for this and we don't even you know how many of us even think about that like the comments that are made around people with sickle cell disease when they come in especially the frequent flyers who are in every day who i i, I will challenge you if you look at their charts all have extensive disastrous social histories and no family supports outside because that's why they're there every day <laughs> So um, um, just wanted to thank everyone for their comments and um, also sharing about uh, the challenges they have, you know, with, with teaching, you know, trans health um, curricula and, and how to improve communication with, uh, trans health, with trans patients in the emergency department. So I'm a resident and I actually just recently gave um, a presentation to my, to my program about, you know, why actually, you know, trans health, uh, you know, being, uh, being able to better communicate with their trans health uh, patients and understand, you know, the medicine that, uh, you know, the trans health uh, patients particularly uh, experience and, and need from us is, is important. And some lessons and things that I got from, um, that I learned from that is that you're right in terms of, you know, definitely had the residents that made inappropriate comments and were very uncomfortable. And I was, of course, in, you know, and I was in that position of where I did correct it, but tried to, you know, correct it in a, in a essentially, you know, kind of like a, uh, uh, kind of forgiving and, you know, maybe almost maternal or whatever, you know, uh, type attitude. But I think for my own sanity and, and, and teaching this and also making sure that I'm not, you know, ostracized and having a miserable time in my residency for the next couple of years is that 
having that attitude of like forgiveness and being like they'll they'll get it they'll get it you know and kind of um, uh, trying to be you know more patient you know and kind with their educational process even though it it can be you know very frustrating and and uh, um, and hard uh, you know as being the what sometimes may feel like the only advocate but. It's hard because I do think that there's there. When I was putting this presentation together, it's not like we have, um, you know, like vetted or um, ED specific trans health uh, cultural competency or or communication cases. So putting this curricula together is really challenging. It's hard. Uh, Cheryl Heron from Emory. So uh, what we're talking about here is courage. And courage has been since the beginning of time. And the willingness to accept that we are all learning is absolutely critical. I will say, though, that it, it takes you know, a little bit of experience and a little bit of uh, moxie to call people out. And I remember personally hearing uh, language that was sort of offensive. And as somebody who's been in the game, I was like, OK, how do I, <laughs> how do I deal with that? And it was totally implicit bias, and you know, it was totally, I love the person, and I just mustered up what I've talked about and just went and said, you know, that was just so not appropriate. And he was like, oh my god, I didn't realize it. So the, the ability to understand where people are coming from in, in their walk, Joel and I uh, did a talk on illuminating the closet, and I talked about, yeah, I don't know anything about being a gay person from a most homophobic country called Jamaica, and I just said it, right? And they're like, oh. And I, and, but, but the willingness to learn and share and talk about these things, the elephant in the room, we just have to be courageous about that. And when you're in leadership, which all of us either are or will be, it is incumbent on us, on us to do that, even if it just feels like you want to vomit. Right, so, sorry, but, I, I, but, but if that's how this is gonna go if we're gonna really try to change, because we're at a crossroads in medicine to Joel's point where historically that wasn't the case. Now we're developing a critical mass of educational tools and people and experts who can really push back against this madness and say, no, that's just not how we conduct ourselves. And as professionals and human beings, we can be better. I, uh, I appreciate everyone's experience specifically with the residents. I think that at our shop, at least like the nurses and the, the culture of the nurses and the, the techs is that if I say something like in that first scenario, if I was like, this is her family member and this is the person who's going to consent, they would just accept it as gospel. Like nobody argues from our, our admin. Like if I want something to happen that is not inside like the hospital protocol, it's just, well, he said so and it moves on which is really nice, but like with the residents and some of even like the near peers, I have a really difficult time with these conversations. So I, I do appreciate everybody's input on that. Um, and would like to hear a little bit more about how you deal specifically with some of the residents. And so thank you for your comment about courage because I think that's one thing that I learned when doing this um, scenario with the trans uh, patient because I, I, I realized in the planning meeting for that scenario that I was going to mess something up when I was trying to teach my residents. And so instead of like trying to dance around the, the fact that I was going to mess something up, I modeled for them. And I said, I'm probably not going to do this well, but let me try what you just tried. Thank you for being open and trying it as the scenario, you know, as a learner in the scenario. Let me try what you just tried. And, and see if I can find a different way to say it. And of course I messed it up, but I learned something too. And so that experience for me was very humbling because I'm a better person after writing the case. Like I was trying to educate my residents with this case and I educated myself in addition, which, which was a rewarding experience. Yeah, I was gonna say that. I think the nice thing about Sim is that when you debrief, <laughs> is that when you debrief, <laughs> But you get that one-on-one -on -one so that that can kind of take, I know, so that you can kind of like take any sort of, you know, if there's other people in the room, they're not going to feel as uncomfortable. You can kind of really sit there with one-on-one -on -one and isolate what's going on in the person's head and kind of talk with them, talk about what, how that might make other people feel because it's probably going to be different for different people in the room. So that kind of some gives you like a nice opportunity in that. 
Hi, my name is Martina Caldwell. I'm an emergency physician at Henry Ford Hospital as well and a diversity, equity, and inclusion champion. So one of the things that I noticed in the first case that we simulated here was right there's a tension between concepts that we're teaching our residents in terms of privacy and confidentiality and then respecting right um, this um, spectrum of diversity in terms of um, sexual orientation, sexuality, and partnership. And so I'm wondering if anybody can give examples of how they would approach it with the residents who point out that tension. I think that would be a very important part of the debriefing, particularly when there's a legal component implied, right, when it comes to privacy and confidentiality and HIPAA, about how do you navigate that scenario. And I imagine it comes up many other times where you have other tensions, right, between your EHR and transgender identity or, you know, many other circumstances where you have to help the residents resolve these conflicts and maybe give them some tools. So I'm wondering what suggestions you might have. I can speak to this. He was one of my residents. You got to do what's right. Mm -hmm. Like HIPAA is, should never be a barrier for you to do the right thing. Um, when times are an emergent, when it's in an emergency, you might get blowback later, which is what I always tell them, but you have to do what's right in the moment for that patient and their family. And that's really the, the gist of most of those debriefs that I give. And I don't, they'll go down rabbit holes of like, will I get sued, will I get sued? I, I don't care, like, stop. If that's your first thing you're thinking of, you should just find a new career. Go out and be a rep somewhere. Like, do something else. You shouldn't be one-on-one -on -one patients if that's your primary thought process. At, afterwards, when, you know, you get blowback later, you can talk about it rationally and reasonably. And we've all been there when we've done something in the moment we thought was right but was wrong. But, yeah, that, I, I, it, they just got to do what's right. We got to train them to do that. I agree with that emphatically. I trained in the Bronx in the 90s um, after crack and HIV ravaged the community. And, you know, we had so many people coming in who were raising kids who weren't even their own. And now we have these laws like HIPAA and EMTALA that completely, you know, it's, it's, I, it's, 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 ignore it. Talk to the person who's there. If they're taking, if they're telling you they're their caregiver, they're the caregiver. And I'll get your back after it no matter what. I, I agree with you. I mean, I think you just have to say that the law is, um, there's, a, there's a great quote from, uh, it's a South African writer, um, and, it, the, and I got to do it right. Uh, law, and dust, law and justice are distant cousins, and in South Africa, they're not even on speaking terms. So, I mean, and so it's, look, the law should be there to guide you, but it shouldn't be there to shackle your behavior around taking care of your patients. You just got to be respectful of that and be cognizant of that if you're going to bend it when you're, when you're doing it. I think just to their point, it's really important to bring these kind of dichotomies up, and I think simulation is a safe space to do it because in debriefing, you can actually challenge them and say, okay, what are you going to do? And as your professional identities are forming, you'll realize that some people are fairly advanced and they will say exactly what Elise said, that hey, you know, this is the right thing to do. This is what we're going to do. But some people will be like, oh, well, I just had my orientation and they talked about HIPAA and are we really supposed to do that? And then that's when you can really get into where their sort of hesitation is coming from. Because a lot of times when somebody is dying or is in a critical situation, you kind of know the people who are their family members. They're distraught. They look upset, right? So yeah, maybe they were not on speaking terms, which is something very difficult to ascertain, but you know, they are family or they're friends and there is a relationship that you can discern. Most people don't have very stoic effects. So, you know, you get a sense of who they are. And even if they do have stoic effects, the point is if they're claiming that they're ten once taking care of a person, then in, 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 for whatever it's worth, you have to trust what they're saying, right? And you have to do the right thing. So I think those things can come up in the debriefing that happens after each of these sim scenarios. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's a big deal. Um, hi, my name is Carmen. I'm actually a pediatric hospitalist, so I am actually not in the EM world, but got invited to this conference to present with our Stanford group, uh, Mike Gisandi and L.A. Alvarez, about diversity and implicit bias and do a whole pre-conference. But um, really to the one comment about developing curriculum in cases, I don't know how many people look outside of EM because I think in pediatrics we're actively working on a lot of these conversations and engaging and building cases. Um, MedEd Portal has been actually a really great resource to figure out other curriculum that are already in existence at other programs that you could easily replicate from the residency perspective and just trying not to reinvent the wheel because I think we're all kind of dealing with the same issues in our subspecialties and it's not just like EM alone, it's everyone who's dealing with this. And then the other part is like, is there any opportunity of doing faculty development and engagement? Because what I have found is a lot of the faculty 
aren't trained to deal with these difficult conversations um, and are very uncomfortable even starting, not even having the courage. And um, oftentimes it takes the weight of people who are coming from marginalized, already diverse backgrounds who've had these experiences to start the conversation. So there's already another burden as you know a physician of color to do this work. So just kind of getting the sense from other faculty and other people in program director, APD roles, what are, is actively being done in that kind of development piece. So my name is Bernie Lopez. I'm the, uh, aside from the fact that I'm an emergency physician, I'm the Associate Dean for Diversity and Community Engagement in the Sidney Kimmel Medical College in Philadelphia. I'm the Provost for Diversity for the University. So I think about these things all the time. So I, I didn't want to take away, you know, this is, I came here because I wanted to learn another tool that we could use at our institution. And this is a great tool, you know, using simulation, getting that experience. So the, the one point that I would make, I'm listening to all the, the conversation, and you've, you probably already know this, you don't need me to tell you, this is really difficult to do. So you have a room here of people who are skilled in simulation, you have a room full of people here who want to do the right thing, and I'm pretty sure that most of us, if not all of us, don't really know how to do this in the perfect way. So one, realize that that's the case. Uh, this is universal, it's not just in emergency medicine, it's universal. People don't know how to deal with it. So the science is easy. You, you, you've got the scenario, you've got the science down. We, I think we can all do the science part. But when we're dealing with uh, an issue, we're trying to teach you know, not just the science, but we're trying to teach probably an even more important concept. We're talking about issues that, that really um, look at the identity of not only our patient, but ultimately it looks at our own identity. So but my one suggestion as we think about this broadly is if you're gonna teach this, you really have to understand who you are, what is your identity. You've got to understand your own biases and how that works then you've got to be educated on the topic, then you're going to have to work with the identities and the biases of the people that you're actually teaching. I'm, I'm thinking about your scenario where you've got the, the opposite ends. Saying shut up, is that's one way to deal with it, might be what I would do, but you've got, you've got uh, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum and you've got to figure out how do you get everybody working together. So I would just say if if you, if we are going to teach this, it's also important to know, you know, what do you believe? How does that affect how you interact with other people? You take that first because people are coming, you're supposed to know this, they're coming to you to, to learn how to do this right, and it really does start with you. So uh, just one point, I, and I, I don't want to take, this is great, this is amazing what you do. I think this is really a model for how you do it, but it's a tool, and there's the other issues that you have to deal with. So I, I, I just didn't want to take away from that, but just wanted to put that point in, because this is not just a science issue. It's really about human interaction. did this was um, we realized uh, that we had an amazing opportunity to collaborate. I'm, I'm an education expert. They're content experts. I, I may be aware of a lot of things, but I'm not a content expert. Amisha is in the back there. We came up with a chest tube training scenario for our entire hospital system to chain all the faculty. So we didn't come up with how to best put in practices for a chest tube. We went to the cardiothoracic surgeons and said, what's the best practice for putting in a chest tube and what do we need to do to modify it in the emergency room? So I think anybody who wants to do this from an education standpoint, yay. Step number one, go to your content expert. Go to people who are dealing with this in your community. Uh, you know, and it's, there are resources out there. I'm happy to introduce you to my colleague at Children's National. She, uh, Children's of LA. She speaks all over the country and is on TV on a regular basis. So, you know, that would be a, there's a great expert. The Diversity Academy has all of their content experts. And part of 
what we were hoping to maybe spin out of this when we did this initially was, is there a possibility for collaboration to create the curriculum that you suggest? Is there a possibility to actually push this maybe to the next level and start having a conversation about a collaborative project across the country looking at can we create a decent content that is around and, and, and scenarios that we can use to move the ball forward. So, and I'll stop talking as the cis white male in the room. <laughs> Do great. So that wraps it up because it sounds like the next group needs to come in. Um, well, we can hang around outside the door if people have questions for, you know, faculty. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs>